behold! The city of Valoria. Stefan Porny, he is an amazing artist. He's one of these artists that has a constant flow of ideas. The best dungeon sculptor on the planet, bar none. Yay! Nothing in the world that is ever great gets done rationally. In the 18 years that I've been doing this, all we were doing was making terrain. Now, we're creating a world, the world of Mithras, the city of Elori, the city that I've created over the course of three decades of me and my friends. <laughs> Characters, maps, stories. Every little thing adds up to a crazy amount of money. Kickstarter 3 is live! <laughs> if we don't go past $2 million, we're basically going bankrupt. It's over. The show is done. This is my masterpiece. You go grab a beer. To Milwaukee. You got to be a little bit nuts and prepared to just go full throttle. Suddenly, rats come swarming out. Roll for initiative. The meeker heart would be like, that's insanity. And that person will never do anything great. I'm trying to get people to come back around the table, talk to each other, fantasize, use their creativity. It's my way of trying to save the human race. So join me in this crusade. Forgot my lines. You know what? Join me in this in this crusade. <laughs> everybody guys take a seat hello thanks so much for being here well thanks so much for having us hello. Hello. i want to say congratulations on i think doing a really wonderful job of opening minds at least mine my mind to the world of dungeons and dragons because i was never a player before uh i'm not gonna lie and say i didn't view it with some kind of some form of elitist skepticism but i think that the way you uh have portrayed him and his world and his art has sort of, it's made me want to, you know, has made me open to giving it a shot. Was that part of the intention? Um, no, I think the, the intention really was um, to make a film about an artist. And D&D and, and &D to me was just kind of secondary. This um, was my intention. <laughs> get, I'm going to get you, man. You're going to get me? <laughs> um, I think we set out to make a movie that people who were not gamers would appreciate, definitely. Absolutely, but I think once you sort of decide to make a movie about an artist who operates primarily within the world of D&D, &D, you're suddenly making a film about an outsider artist, and you have to sort of bring them into whatever that outside world is that, that they're a part of. And in order to pre appreciate his art, they have to appreciate the game at that point as well. Totally. Yeah. yeah. I mean... I'm not a gamer, so I, I was able to approach it with an outsider view as well. Um, but when I was a kid, like I wanted to play, but it just never it never happened for me. Like I didn't have enough people that actually wanted to play with me, so it just kind of fell by the wayside. Um, I did get to finally play with him, and this was like you know twenty something years later. It was like the ultimate dungeon master all of a sudden. It was like the the ultimate D and D experience. What does it mean to be the ultimate dungeon master? Because you are considered by many to be the ultimate dungeon master. Oh, man. Well, thank you. Uh, I, <laughs> uh, and like any great dungeon master, he's wearing a Black Sabbath shirt. So that's... Ozzy! <laughs> <laughs> um, well, speaking of Sabbath, I mean, uh, one of the things I, I, I've been playing since I was 12, and... Um, you know, you learn little by little. First, you're player, then you eventually start running games. And now it's like, with like 35 years later, you know. And what happened, I, once I started making the, the three dimensional dungeons and the painting the miniatures, um, we started to think about taking it to the next step, you know. And I always like, when I was a little kid, I used to see those, that magic guy on TV. What was his name? He had long hair and bell-bottom jeans and used to like make tigers appear out of thin air. 
Siegfried or Roy? No, farther than that, man. He used to have like stars on his jeans. Does anyone know who this guy is? No. Well, <laughs> I feel horrible, I don't remember, but he was like almost a hippie looking guy. And it was back in the days when, when the TV had to adjust the antennas, you know, to get reception. And it had an impact on my small mind. And um, so performer, performer. So um, I think later in life it kind of clicked that like maybe D&D should be a bit of more of a performance, you know? So I got the, the smoke machine, I started wearing the outfits and started with sound effects and, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. So uh, I call it theatrical D&D. So it's not like really what real D&D is. Real D&D is like theater of the mind. But if you start to uh, enact things and put on masks, and I would like throw nets on people, and when a spider would get them, I would throw a net on you, you know? That kind of stuff is more like, uh, you know, making it more fun. And one of the uh, things that you say in the documentary, a, a couple of times in the documentary, which is, uh, I liked is that you're trying to get people to play games where they socialize once again. They're not candy crushing or something. They're actually doing something with other people in the room and experiencing other people. Yeah, well, at the heart of it, uh, it's about storytelling. You know, going back to the days of sitting around a campfire, telling stories, having fun, throwing popcorn, you know, whatever. And I worry, I really worry that we're heading towards a, uh, a zombie apocalypse of uh, droids. You know, we're just going to stare at our iPhones, and we were just in Starbucks around the corner, and everyone is in front of a laptop, and it's scary, man. It's like we're actually living in the matrix, and we have to take evasive action. We got to get people around the table and shake them out of it, and, you know, even you if you're... get people playing D&D. &D. Play some D&D, &D, man, and, you know, sit around and, and, and be goofy, and don't be afraid to take on another persona and, and just have fun, you know? Let's retain our humanity. S social interaction is a big Yeah. Thing. Like actually mean? physically speaking to each other yeah. is, is, is a big thing. And right. that's something for you as a filmmaker that's a great thing to shoot. I mean, I, I imagine you started shooting him because of the art itself, of the, of the miniatures, and then you find this sort of other social world where people are really interacting with each other. Like GaryCon, you, take, you go to this thing called GaryCon with him, which is like a convention. Talk about what GaryCon is. Well, GaryCon is... Um, a convention. It's in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, and um, I'm sure that a lot of people here know and a lot of people in the audience know, Gary Gygax created Dungeons & Dragons. Um, when Gary died after their funeral, after his funeral, excuse me, um, everyone got together and played games. And then they had such an amazing time that they just decided they were going to do a convention every single year. So now it's, it's what, what is it, it's like the 10th, 9th, or the 10th year? I'm bad with numbers. I think he, it's, like, it's like the 8th or the 9th year. So yeah. it's, it's basically a convention in honor of Gary Gygax, the founder of Dungeons & Dragons, and it's put together by his family. What was it like for you going there as a filmmaker, someone who's not really a part of the gaming world at all? Um, that, at that point in the filming, it, it was great because we'd just, I'd just been in his workshop the whole time, basically, you know, for a couple of months already. So actually getting out of the studio and going and, and seeing him in his element, for me, I mean, he's become somewhat of a celebrity in the, in the gaming industry, so actually getting to see him you know, kind of be treated like royalty. I, I, I ran a game there. You filmed me running the game for Luke Gygax and Peter Atkinson, and, and those those are the big hitters, you know? Yeah, Luke, Luke Gygax is uh, Gary Gygax's son. Peter Atkinson, uh, like... Magic the Gathering. Wrote and started right? Magic the Gathering, like yeah. these titans of the industry. Yeah, they, they were playing in my game. So he got to run a game for them. Talk about what it's like for you to be a part of this uh, underground world of, of gamers where there are these celebrities to you and to the other gamers and now being a part of something that's going to bring, possibly bring those names to a lot more people through this documentary. Well, they're, they're not celebrities to me. They're drinking buddies. <laughs> <laughs> Hang around and drink spotted cow beer and uh, get crazy and... Uh just a bunch of guys just like us and you know we we just hang out and we like to play games and socialize and you know the reason I got to know these big shots is because we were always like the last ones in the bar hanging out and after a while we just say you know we're hanging out together let's play D&D &D together tomorrow and then that's a friendship that built up over you know you know a decade or more and in the meantime I mean basically, you know, part of the, he's almost part of the Gygax clan, like he knows the whole family, which 
I thought was insane to like like gr you know growing up you know worshiping or not worshiping but but being in awe of this dude who created this game and then all of a sudden he's like that, part that, of the claim that is mind bending to me like I when I was a little I was 14 years old probably I'm looking at the books and I'm like, Gary Gygax what a name who is this guy he's like this mysterious god you know and then uh, now we're at the bar doing shots, you know, like, <laughs> well, not, I met, I met uh, Gary once, or a few times, but uh, I remember meeting him first time in a, in a bar, and coming up to me, like, Mr. Guy, yes, thank you so much, you know, he was a very friendly, nice guy, and, um, and consequently, I got to know all the other family members, and, um, you know, he, he's a great uh, genius, you know, I think people don't realize the things that he, he did, one of the things is creating this book that, uh, allows you, the players, to create, you see, lay down the framework. It's not the rules aren't, you know, like, cemented. He says in the book, these are just guidelines. It's up to you to change the rules if you want, make up uh, what you have, fill in the blanks or the areas that I didn't cover. And a lot of us, we took that to heart. And we, so we started building our own worlds. And, and every dungeon master has their own world, and we fill in the blanks, and you, you make it your own, and then you share it with your friends. It's a very, it's a game about sharing and cooperation. And, you know, when you go on these missions into these dungeons, you, you go as a team, like a, a kind of a medieval fantasy SWAT team. And everyone has to, one guy has the bow, you know, some girl is a sorcerer, you know, and someone else is the rogue, is unpicking the locks. You have to work as a team to overcome the evil monsters. And um, so that's why there's no, like, winner at the end of the game. It just goes on and on and on uh, for years. And it's great. It's about group cooperation and teamwork. That's why it's such a great game. What was it about him as an artist that made you want to profile him? Because um, he'd taken something that's as um, obscure as Dungeons and & Dragons and turned it into an artistic medium. Like, literally turned it into a paintbrush. Like, it's his artistic vehicle. It's what he... He's not just a sculptor. He's not just a storyteller. He's taken this whole thing and done something completely different with it. And that, that's what I found to be so fascinating. How long does it take you to put together, you know, one of your, one of, one of the miniatures that you put together, the worlds? You mean to set up a game? Or? No, 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 to build the actual, like, uh, the, game, the game itself, the, the board, for lack of a better term? To sculpt it or to? To sculpt it, yeah. Well, I've been in business for 20 years. So uh, every year we come out with new stuff. Kind of like uh, Lego, you know, you add more stuff and it's compatible with the stuff before, but you just build more and more stuff. Like during the Kickstarter, we were doing a modular medieval city, and this past March we did castles. Well, the castles are compatible with the city, so you can you can put a city pieces on top of a castle. You can you can mix them together, and underneath that you can put caverns and sewers and uh, dungeons. You can have multi-levels if you want. That's crazy. Yeah, it's, so it is you, crazy. <laughs> so, as you build them, are you sort of trying to build them so that you can add the different layers to each year? Like with, when you build a new, a new world the next year, do you hope that that can be added onto the previous? You kind of want, yeah, I mean, everything is in the same scale. You sort of want to, I don't think that far ahead. I, I just do like, um, I concentrate on that year with sort of a strange, vague idea of, well, we'll figure something out next year to top that. Right now, we're going to go back to dungeons. We're going to go back to uh, our bread and butter, which is the, the dungeons below. We're going to add some traps and all kinds of crazy stuff, you know, flesh it out. Do you find that the dungeons sell better? Everybody loves dungeons. You know, that's <laughs> the rooms and passageways where trolls are and all that kind of, you know. What have you found that Dungeons and Dragons has sort of done for you throughout your life? Well, it's, it's greatly enriched my life, you know. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. I've met a lot of great people. Um, the people in the industry are wonderful. They're, they're all like role players, you know. And when you play six or eight hours or ten hours together passionately, uh, you create great bonds of friendship, you know get together every week and uh, it's fun, you know. Um, you get to see, you're put, putting yourselves into situations where like, oh my God, 
There's a dragon is coming. He's going to breathe fire. And what do you do? And, you know, some people run for the door. Some people will cast spells to protect their teammates. You know, you get to see really who's who. Their characters, their personalities come out at the heat of the moment. And um, when you do that again and again, you really get to know each other really well. And, and that creates strong, everlasting friendships. I would say about 75% of my friends are people I, I met through D&D. You know? Now, at the beginning of this interview, you said that you never got to play D&D as a kid. 20 years later, you finally got to play. How was it? It was hilarious. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. But I mean, he also, it, it, there's, you know, he has a certain way of dungeon mastering, and it's, it's, he makes sure that everyone has a really good time, and it's, it's often humorous. It's very funny. So. You also did the music for the film, right? That is, yeah, that is correct. So you directed, did the music. That's incredible. Well, thank you. Multi-talented. Uh, what was it? Thank you. Yeah, that's nice. Um, what made you go with this soundtrack? What, like this particular sound? Um, it's like an acoustic Sabbath to, to a degree, like it's, the drop well, D tuning. And well, things. we're both metal fans, um, obviously. Um, but I, I've been playing guitar since I was 11 years old. And somewhere around age 16, I decided I was going to make films. But I never stopped playing. And um, I figured out I, wanna, I also want to score my films. So when we started editing, um, I had some temp tracks that I'd just been laying down at home and feeding them to, to our editor, Victoria. And it was just jiving. It was just going really well. So we stayed with that feel. And I have to say it was a blessing as a director to also be a musician for me personally because I was, I was able to use it as a directional tool. Like if I didn't know how to um, describe a scene, how I wanted it to feel, I would just let her hear the music. And then, and then I mean, and that's really how the atmosphere of the film was sculpted. Anyway, so I, I feel very fortunate in that I was given that chance to, to also be able to do the music. Absolutely. Uh, I'm gonna open it up to the audience for questions. Does anyone have any questions out here? Hey, you guys, uh, I'm with you with that. There was a disconnect from humanity, and I'd play D&D with you any day of the week. So my question for you... Just Bushwick, going right? Up, Wait, hold on. Don't you play D&D don't you play D &D in Bushwick? Yes, we do. There we go. I'm in. Come on out, man. Hey. <laughs> where, I'll take do you, you wanna, up on that invite. Where, where, where in Bushwick do you, do you play, right? You have, I, like, I have a gallery. I have a gallery, an art gallery, called Zaltar's Gallery of Fantastical Art off the Morgan Avenue stop, and it's a gallery I opened. Thank you. <laughs> and it's got my artwork on the walls. It's got some of the maps I've drawn for Luke Gygax and Tim Kask, their worlds. So it shows, showcases some of the art of Dungeons and & Dragons. And uh, about once a week, uh, we have people come in. Maybe we have a keg, so we drink beer and we play D&D. &D. Uh, no, that's awesome. $10. Uh $10 buy-in. No, that's very cool. That actually leads me to my question. Just watching the documentary, I was very impressed with the theatrics when staging the game. Has it ever crossed your mind to maybe take that idea? And like, I know crazy stuff goes down at St. Mark's Place all the time in the city. They put on different shows like with um, Full House and just other sort of like culty kind of things that do get a big following. Have you ever thought of maybe doing a one-off big special event of putting on a production of some sorts based off of D&D? To me, I think there's a lot of potential there. I, well, I'm not sure what you're talking about. We should, we should put a production on, like a play? Like, or do like performance art D&D? Yeah. &D? I think so, just the, by looking at what you guys like have done. Like That's pretty rad. Like performance Siegfried and players. Roy kind of. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> I mean, that would probably work. I mean, the answer to your question is no, but that's an awesome idea. <laughs> Next question. Hi, how are you? Um, crazy segue, I was actually in a play about D&D, &D, and like the character, yeah, I'm not oh, even wow. kidding, Good. someone wrote it, it was some like new writer, and some of the characters, like I played a character in the real world, and then we all had other actors playing our characters. What, what was the name of that play? It was called Of Dice and Men. Oh, and I've heard of this. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. It actually it happened in London, so it wasn't even over here. But um, awesome. it's cool. It's cool. But anyway, my question is: When you actually play D and D, and not just act in a play about it, um, how do you go about building your character? And what was your favorite character you've ever played as? I'm I'm usually the dungeon master, oh, right. but I, I do have a character. I have several characters I've had over the years. Uh, the latest one was Zaltar, 
That's why I named the gallery after him. And um, to create the character is just rolling dice. You know, it's kind of like, I like the fact you have to roll dice because that's sort of like, we were all born into the world with some genetics that we're not, you know, responsible for. So it's luck of the dice for all of us. So D&D is very mirroring real life. So we have to roll the dice and you can adjust them somewhat. And I like to have these rules, homegrown rules, you know, where, where throughout your character's life, you can change those numbers if you try hard, because I think that's the same in real life, you know. What was, what, what's Zaltar? What is he? He's like a magician. Zaltar is a conjurer. He's an illusionist. Uh, you know, he raises the dead and, you know, he's not a good guy. He's, <laughs> he's, a, he's a bad guy. Uh, and I had, you know, other guys used to like to play half orcs because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm half, uh, you know, half Korean, half American. So I was like, um, when I was young, I was very much um, feeling like uh, I could feel like a half orc too, you know. So you could sort of pick characters that are that you, um, you know, feel what feel like them. I can't remember the words, you know, <laughs> but. You know, D and D allows you to live your fantasies and try to uh, uh, pick different characters or pick characters that you feel this represents how I feel, and then go out into this world and uh, get killed. You know, then roll up another character and you do it again and again, and you know that kind of like hardens you to the real world in a way as well. You know. Um, I think we have time uh, for one more question right here. Hi. Uh, I noticed there's a lot of cosplay during the conventions. Do you um, do you make your own word, uh, costumes, or, or, do, or do other people make, or, or have any, has anybody asked you to make costumes? And also, uh, do you play any other role-playing games besides D&D? I, I have very little time lately, so uh, I rarely play in games. Uh, I actually I get I get invited to conventions as a guest to run games, and that's when I I, I run the games. Uh, the cosplay, I love it. I mean, cosplay has brought in so many new people into the hobby. They go to these conventions, and especially uh, females, you know, where when I was in the, in the 70s, 80s, there were very few girls playing. Uh, but now you see it's almost like 50-50, girls and guys, and I think that cosplay had a lot to do with that. And so they come to the conventions, they dress up, and they're like, here, I'm, I'm here at the show, and wow, maybe I'll play some games now. Maybe I'll try that out. And then they end up loving it, you know, because uh, it's a fun game for everybody. And it's made everything so much better. It's, it's, I think, this sort of, we're in a gaming renaissance, and the second coming of D&D &D is even better because it's more uh, uh, inclusive to everybody. And uh, everyone should go and try it out. Absolutely. I think this movie's going to do a good job of, uh, of getting people to try it out. When can people see the movie, guys? It's out now. You can see it on. Uh, it's out on pretty much all VOD platforms. Uh, iTunes. It's out there. It's out there. Uh, iTunes, uh, Hulu, uh, everything. It's on everything. It's on everything right now. Door or not, guys, check it out. Thanks so much for being here, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.